listen only mode. Hi, good afternoon. This is Lauren Wenzel from the National Marine Protected Areas Center. I'm happy to welcome you to our continuing webinar series with EBM Tools and Open Channels. And today we're going to be hearing about monitoring and evaluation of spatially managed marine areas, MESMA, which is a project in Europe. And we're going to be hearing from uh, our two presenters who have uh, stayed, stayed up till 7 o'clock their time to, to fill us in on this. So I'm going to introduce them in just a moment and then talk about the format of the webinar. So we're pleased to welcome Oscar Bos, who is the marine ecologist based in the Netherlands, where he works for MRS, the Institute for Marine Resources and Ecosystem Studies, part of Again Again University and Research Center. And he coordinates and takes place in studies on biodiversity, MPAs, and the effect of human use on biodiversity in the Dutch part of the North Sea. And within the European MESMA project, Oscar was in charge of the dissemination activities. And Vanessa Stelzenmuller is uh, the head of the research unit of marine spatial management and integrated ecosystem assessment at the Thulin Institute for Seas Fisheries, where she is working on the development of methods and tools to support an ecosystem-based marine spatial management. Her present work comprises the analysis of conflicts between fisheries and other uses, such as offshore renewables and valuable ecosystem components. And she is in charge of several EU projects that are concerned with the development of both science and practical tools to support sustainable marine spatial management. So welcome, both of you. And uh, before I turn it over to Oscar to start us off, I just wanted to mention that we are going to be uh, hearing from both our presenters first, and then we're going to be fielding questions. We should have 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the presentation for questions. So I would just encourage you to go ahead and type your questions into the question box on the webinar interface, and we will get to those at the end. So uh, again, thanks to our presenters, and I will turn it over to Oscar. Well, good afternoon, everyone, or good night if you're from Europe. Uh, thanks for listening. We're really happy that we can present our project um, on EBM tools. So we have three parts. Um, the first part is about marine spatial planning in general, just to give you a little background and, and see how our project fits in. Uh, then Vanessa will talk about the MESMA project and the results and the, and the methodology that was developed during this project. And then um, I will take over and I will also demonstrate part three, which is uh, the marine spatial planning evaluation tool that we, we are developing now. It's not completely finished, but you can see the prototype. So let's go to the, to the first part. In Europe, um, the main driver or an important driver of marine spatial planning is uh, the renewable energy that uh, is now being developed um, and tidal energy, uh, tidal energy, offshore wind farms, those kind of uh, types of energy and for example in the North Sea, that's where our country is, um, they really want to increase uh, offshore wind farms, the number of offshore wind farms and to do so they need to know where to plan these farms and they have to take into account all the other human uses that you can see listed here, so as shipping, fisheries, uh, the gas and oil industry, etc. So that's one important driver and here you have an overview of the current situation in uh, northern Europe or Europe in general I would say of the offshore wind uh, energy. So this is how it is now and there are lots of plans to do to make uh, much more of these parks. So it's really important uh, for the marine spatial planners to, you know, to know where to put them and, to, and what to take into account. Another driver, and a very important driver, is um, nature conservation. So in Europe we have a system of European directives, which are a kind of laws, and um, the, the birds directive was developed in 1979, and that aims to protect birds. And that means that countries in Europe have to implement this directive in the national legislation and they have to make sure that they protect birds. Another uh, important directive is uh, the Habitat Directive from 1992. The Habitat Directive is mainly focused on terrestrial Europe but also a little bit on marine Europe um, and it protects for example sandbanks, seagrass beds, reefs, uh, deep sea habitats and other habitats as well as a number of uh, migratory fish species, so that migrate between the sea and, uh, and the mainland, or the, the land, and uh, marine mammals. So those two directives from the 1970s and the 1990s were really focused on, on habitats and species, 
Uh, since 2008, we have a more integral uh, directive, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, which focuses on 11 different so-called descriptors. Um, one of them is uh, that biodiversity should be maintained, so we, you know, we should this uh, implementation of the Convention of Biodiversity. Uh, the seabed should be not um, um, demolished too much. Uh, the food web should be in a natural state. So it's a whole set of things that describe the sea and that should be in a healthy state. And the overall aim is to, to define targets for each of these uh, things and we call that the good environmental status and the countries in Europe now have to work towards this good environmental status by uh, defining a set of measures. So that's what's, what's going on uh, and what drives uh, marine spatial planning uh, from the nature conservation side. And if you have a look at this uh, picture, you can see that um, this is the, uh, the network of marine protected areas based on the habitat directive and the birds directive. So those two together uh, make marine protected areas. And um, this is the progress at this moment. It's not always a real marine protected area yet. I mean, for example, in the Netherlands, we have these uh, green areas, as you can see in the middle of the picture. But um, they're until now only paper parks, and they're currently talking, they're discussing about the kind of fishery measures they want to take in these areas. So, um, but it's a, a good way forward. So, what is marine space planning exactly? You've seen some examples. Um, well, there's a lot of different words for the same thing or for the same concept and these are slides that were taken from uh, Charles Ehler who is a specialist in marine spatial planning, you probably know him. He's got a guide how to do it and he presented that at our conference in uh, October and this is one of his slides and it shows that there are many different names for, the, for marine spatial planning. So for example, you, there's marine maritime spatial planning, uh, integrated management, special area management planning, and what they have in common is that, um, that they are all, and he, these are the characteristics of marine spatial planning, they are all strategic and future oriented, uh, they involve stakeholders, so it's a participatory process, they're all ecosystem based, and there is a number of um, objects from different uh, angles, so e economical uh, objectives, societal objectives, ecological objectives um, that are in that kind of plan. And a very important thing is, and that's in the white box, that it is a continuing and adaptive process with an emphasis on the performance, uh, uh, monitoring and evaluation of the plan. So that's one of the characteristics of marine spatial planning. You have to evaluate it and come forward with a better plan the next time you make a plan. So let's have a look at uh, where in the world we have approved marine spatial plans and this uh, is shown with the, the blue dots on this picture. There's a lot of other plans in, under development now and they will be implemented in the future. So and this is again from Charles Ehler. Uh, what have we learned in marine spatial planning? Well in general marine spatial planning works. There is no best approach as you've seen there are different ways how to do it. Um, well, there's a whole list of things and you can see number 13 that's monitoring and evaluation, sorry, monitoring and evaluation uh, of the performance of such a plan is really important. And then if you do that you can adapt the plan and uh, come forward with a, a new one. So that was the introduction on marine spatial planning and now uh, Fadessa will take over and show you some results of the MESMA project. So the MESMA, the MESMA project was uh, basically tackling the question on how can we evaluate the effectiveness of spatially managed areas in Europe. It was a four years project which ended at the end of last year and it comprised 21 partners and it had a funding volume of 8.5 million euros. So the aim of MESMA was to produce an integrated and flexible management toolbox um, that comprises concepts, models and guidelines for the monitoring and evaluation of spatially managed marine areas at different scales, local, national and regional scales. So 
At the center of the project was a so-called MESMA framework. And the MESMA framework is basically a process that guides to that the steps of monitoring and evaluation. This framework has been developed, tested and applied in nine different case studies across Europe. And its application has been underpinned by tool recommendations, by data requirements and by recommendations on data warehousing via the GeoPortal. And it has been surrounded, or it was surrounded and interlinked with a detailed governance analysis to finally produce some recommendations for marine spatial management. Now let's have a closer look at this MESMA framework. As, as you can see, um, it is a stepwise process. Uh, it comprises seven steps. So um, it starts with the uh, setting of the context. So what are the temporal and spatial boundaries of the area, the spatially managed area would like to assess? What are the related goals and operational objectives within this area? And then <coughs> in relation to those goals, what are the relevant ecosystem components, including also human components or human activities and pressures and their impacts? and the um, existing management measures. From that point on, indicators are derived and indicators are assessed to then conduct a state assessment or a risk analysis. And in step five, it's then the summary of those indicators assessments to see how they work in terms of um, the operational objectives defined and then to derive an evaluation of management effectiveness and finally give some rec give some recommendations. So um, as I said before, this structured process is surrounded and interlinked with a governance research analysis and the starting point is uh, to identify the key policies and legal provisions, the key management measures, conflict and stakeholders and then and the governance research and this has some cross-cutting themes representing wider scale institutional or structural issues. And those findings from this governance analysis are feedback then, it can be feedback in a later stage of the framework. So, um, so the framework is a structured process and it comes with a detailed manual on its application. So behind each of those steps there is a detailed description of tasks and actions and instructions how to <coughs> produce the different outputs for those different steps. So um, we produced a paper manual but in part three of this presentation today you, you will see that we produced a prototype database um, which offers an e-manual, e electronic version of this manual uh, which can be used directly. So, and if you're interested in the, uh, further in the rationale behind this framework, which was built on existing knowledge and lessons learned, you can have a look at the paper from last year, which was published in Marine Policy. You also have soon a paper um, to coming out about the uncertainty that is related to the application of this framework. And, and on the website of the project, you can directly download the PDFs that represent all those um, results. Now, I mentioned before that we had um, nine different case studies where this framework has been developed and tested. Now, let's have a closer look at those MESMA case studies. So, you can see that we have nine different case studies distributed in southern and northern Europe. So, um, these case studies present a wide geographical range. They are different widely in terms of their spatial scale. So we have, for example, areas such as the Southern North Sea, which is number one, but also we zoom, we zoom in to um, smaller areas, just as the Pentland Firth and Orkney Waters, but also we comprise areas or included areas such as the Barents Sea um, Spatial Management Plan, which is a vast marine area. And then again, we have smaller areas such as the Basque Country, Continental Shell, for example, number five. So um, we not only have national examples, but we also have cross-border um, examples. And on the scales or on the case studies we selected, we find that we have, um, in some cases, marine spatial planning processes uh, in, in progress. So marine spatial plans are 
being developed. And, and where you can see the cross, that means at the scale we um, defined those case studies, there is no actual real-world marine spatial planning ongoing. Only in the Barents Sea we have an implemented up and running marine spatial plan. So this makes it really clear that we have such a wide variation of cases and possible uh, faces on, and possible um, facets of marine spatial planning and this framework and its manual needed to be flexible enough to address and to be applicable for all those different cases. Now, um, we want to uh, showcase uh, one case study examples to give you a better flair or give you a, a flavor for the different steps of this framework and what is really behind those uh, different steps. So as an example, we selected the Black Sea case study, uh, which is limited by the national territory um, of Bulgaria plus a 12 nautical mile offshore areas. So basically, uh, in step one, which is about the context setting, the definition of spatial and temporal boundaries, it's about to define, is there an existing spatial management plan? If this is the case, then you can list the goals, the overarching goals and the operational objectives. So with operational objectives, we mean objectives where clear targets and measures can be defined. So in, in, in many cases, as we have seen before, there are no existing marine spatial plans. That means goals and operation objectives must be constructed or should be constructed, for example, from overarching marine policies and to run then through that process. In step two, then the different um, ecosystem components and pressures that are related to those relevant objectives are then not only listed but also mapped. So step two asks explicitly for mapping all these different components. And some, for example, the table that is included in this manual links directly the ecosystem components back to the defined relevant objectives. So this is the key of this framework to link all those things back to the identified operational objectives. So here, for example, from the Black Sea, you have then um, products or a number of maps showing different different uh, human activities. So step three is about the indicator assessment. So um, the indicators need to be defined together with um, desired thresholds or uh, just expected trends um, so that those can be assessed, for example, uh, in the Black Sea case study, the um, seagrass biomass was selected as one indicator. And in this indicator assessment step, it's about um, giving also transparent information about the availability on the data, give further remarks, give a quality check of uh, those underlying data <coughs> uh, together with the actual indicator assessment. Step four is the risk analysis and state assessment. So a state assessment is the actual assessment of the current state. So that means if you have an implemented plan, you have your objectives, you have your selected indicators, hopefully, and you could then assess how they are doing, how those indicators are behaving. In cases where you don't have an in implemented spatial plan, you conduct actually a risk analysis. Risk analysis um, means you assess um, the outcomes of different management options. So um, in step five, you then basically produce a technical summary of this risk analysis or state assessment. So for each indicator, indicator that was or is related to an operational objective, you basically, basically give an evaluation and you summarize that. So in step five, you maybe produce operational objectives and indicator matrices that and allows you to summarize information or there are cases where you don't just simply don't have the data and you cannot um, conduct the indicator assessment and you would have for example descriptions on describing trends maybe on a qualitative level and maybe it's a really worth mentioning that in the manual you will find or you will see that all these different steps and actions are designed to be able to deal with different data qualities. That means what do you do when you have good data situation and what do you do if you have no data or very, very weak data. So you are offered with many options to, to run your way through that um, 
framework. So basically then in step, step six, which is about the evaluation of management effectiveness, you will then find um, uh, the findings for sure if there's any mismatch in current management measures. So you will be able to identify why are certain things are working and why they're not working. So basically you have then for each of those operational objectives, you match that with the management measures you have identified and you give judgments on how useful it was and you will be able to structure and summarize um, all your findings. And at the same time, the manual offers a way to how to, to treat or to deal with the uncertainty that comes with the knowledge base you already produced up to that step six. But it's also really worth to mention that um, this step is really, um, there's a complement uh, understanding of the views of the different stakeholders on the effectiveness of the existing management measures. So how did they see or what's their views on the validity, validity of um, these different objectives. So in step six explicitly links the governance analysis back into this um, uh, framework step. So the final step, it's about the adaption of the current management, is um, to, to summarize all those different um, findings again and then give recommendations either for example that the boundaries are, are not working or different objectives might not working or some management measures uh, have been found to work very well and here it becomes clear that this is meant to be an iterative process that means an assessor could combine different goals and objectives and could relate different indicators and see uh, how um, the management process uh, would work. And it gives, uh, and that's a very good way of identifying gaps, gaps in data, gaps in knowledge, um, and so on. So just then we have a uh, quick look on the governance analysis a bit in um, more detail. So as I said before, this governance analysis that comes with the framework uh, is uh, a very is interlinked at certain points, but it also is a much more detailed um, framework. So basically, uh, it provides uh, this framework for governance and as provides a systematic and structured approach to analyze governance in marine spatial planning. Basically, it deconstructs governance into different incentive categories, and it allows to examine the effectiveness of different governance approaches. And uh, here it has to be noted that there's no single correct way to deconstruct and analyze governance. So with this MESMA analytical framework, um, it's, it's, not, it's not the only solution. It's a, a possible, it's a possible uh, way and it's not a fixed, fixed product. So there are further um, development and adaptations possible depending on the circumstances where this um, analytical framework might be applied. And, um, so this has been a very active component within the MESMA frame, framework. So if you are interested in this uh, really comprehensive governance analysis work, you should have a look at that top link. And also just recently we had a really good, fantastic paper on the emerging policy landscapes for marine spatial planning in Europe, also published in um, marine policy. And with that, I would like to um, uh, swap back to Oscar, who will continue with the tools. Oscar, we're not hearing you. Are you on mute? So sorry. <laughs> do you hear me? Yeah, we do you hear me now. Yes, oh. we do. Yeah, I was talking and um, nobody was listening. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Do you hear me? Yes, yeah, we hear you now. Can you? Okay, good. Sorry for that. So the tools are also was also an important part of the MESMA project. Um, we made an inventory of tools that link to the framework. So tools can be GIS tools to uh, to map data. They can be communication tools to organize workshops, uh, modeling tools, etc. So we made a whole list of them, about 70, and they are all linked to one of these steps or more steps. Um, 
in the framework, as you can see here. For example, uh, the spatial data modelers linked to step number 2A ecosystem components. And I will come back to that later to show you an example. And then the last thing is the, the geo portal. Um, as Vanessa mentioned, maps are really important. You have to map your data in these uh, first steps. So what we did um, was that we uh, put a lot of effort in collecting data of all the different case studies. And of course, a number of data sets were not described at all, so they had to be described with metadata first. Uh, we, in some areas we have a lot of data, but they are not uh, in the right format. So in the end, we, they all uh, were described in the same ISO standards and also in, a, in an INSPIRE standard, and that's a new European way of standardizing metadata. And what you can see here is uh, the themes that are under this INSPIRE uh, standard, and we try to put our data in that, uh, in, in that system because that Inspire system is, is just new and we wanted to test it, whether it would fit or not. So we collected about, um, uh, about 900 metadata records of the case studies, of which maybe 150 can be plotted on the map, as you can see uh, here. Um, most of them are descriptions of data sets, and for a number of case studies, uh, data sets were described that were never described before, so that's already took a lot of effort. Um, it's, a, it's just a standardized warehousing of metadata and, and geodata, and we plot them on this map by interconnected web services. That means that the data themselves are located on computers or servers of institutes across Europe, and they're all linked um, in one geo portal. So, um, that was an overview of our project, of the kind of the work packages that you usually have in a project. And then towards the end of the project, we thought we needed some kind of tool that integrated all of this into a, a single website. And then not a project website, but a website focused on the methodology. So that's what we tried to make. We call it MESMA Central Exchange, so the kind of platform to exchange the methodology and the information of the MESMA project. And what we basically did was we, we took the, uh, the MESMA analysis, the governance analysis, the tools, the geoportal, and the data produced by the case studies, and changed that into a website, as you can see here. So it's basically a digital version of the framework that uh, Vanessa just explained. Um, and you can enter it at different, in different ways, and I will guide you through it. So if you are a new user, you can just click on new user and you will get some information about what it is and uh, what you can do with it. Um, and if we then go back to the home page again, you can click on analysis and then you go to the digital version of this scheme. So it starts with this scheme and the idea is that you click on one of these steps and then you enter the step and you can go further. Um, if you scroll down, you see this, uh, that there are seven steps here for the framework. And if you click on one of these steps, for example, step 2A that uh, Vanessa just showed, existing information, collation and mapping, the idea is that you, from this step, you can start the analysis and go into the detailed manual. And that's what um, we call the e-manual. So in this, it's a kind of database with text and uh, explanations. Um, you can enter your data fill in tables, uh, make use of pre-filled tables, extend these tables, etc. So in this way you collect your data in a database uh, that you need for the analysis. Um, as we just saw, um, we have collected all these tools and they are connected to the steps, so you can also do it the other way around. Click on a step and see what tools are connected to them. So for step 2b, um, we have for example marine reserve and local fisheries and interactive simulation tool, Netica, etc. You should have a look and you can uh, see for yourself. Um, then we have the geodata. So the idea was to um, to show some example data sets that connect to that step. So in this case, for example, the seaweed uh, distribution in Ireland is an example of natural resources. Let me go back. And the last part is help and examples. And if you click on this button, 
you will see the, the results of our case studies for this step. So you can you know, see what kind of information should be filled in and uh, you can be inspired by that. Um, here's what you get. You can, you can see these case studies and you can click on a link and you get a PDF with, um, with the example. Um, so that was the, the, the analysis with the seven steps. Then we had the other analysis, the, the governance analysis, and we made the same kind of um, stepwise approach for that as well. And then you can also look in another, you can search in another way through these tools, of course. Um, so we, we divided them into categories. So if you look for habitat, um, you get all the tools that are somehow connect to, uh, to habitat. So that's, that's really interesting if you are uh, trying to or you want to evaluate your marine spatial planning and you're looking for a specific tool, you can they're tested and pre-selected here so you can easily find something. Uh, then we go to the oh, per tool, oh, sorry, per tool there's a description. Um, as I showed before, you can see which step it can be used, but there's also a detailed description including hyperlinks to where you can find the tool itself and uh, how to apply it. And if we then go to the GeoPortal, um, you can on the on the top right side you can see the MESMA case studies and if you click on that button you can get uh, the data sets per case study, for example the Black Sea. So opposite this case study was Sochi with the Olympic Games, this is the western part. Um, and you see all the, the data sets that are collected in that case study and you can click on that and plot them. And this is an example of another case study, this is uh, uh, near Sicily and you can see some uh, uh, spawning grounds of fish for example. So and of course we have an, an help pages where you can um, look for examples or uh, look for the tools, get the documents about the MESMA governance analysis or find the literature and uh, for example you can get the whole reports for every case study for the whole analysis. So that was the, the, the tool that we tried to develop. It's not finished yet but um, we hope we can improve it in the future. We hope it will be useful. So what are the lessons learned from our project? Well, we think the framework is really suitable for a lot of different cases, as Vanessa explained. You can have data poor case studies or data rich cases. The governance situation can be complex or simple. Uh, marine spatial planning can be in place or not or in the development. So it's suitable for all of those situations. Um, it's a standardized process. So the, 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 the most important thing is the rationale of the methodology but you can also extend it or include uh, other methodology. And then the strong and the weak points, um, what we noticed in the case studies is that especially in the cross-boundary cases, so where you have, for example, in the North Sea where you have different countries that share one sea, it's really hard to, to find all this data and put them together. Um, as Vanessa explained, the definition of objectives can be really hard, so when there are no clear management boundaries, there will be not uh, clear objectives, so it's hard to test that. And a really strong point is that the, the framework is really tested with all our case studies. It has been improved by um, in several uh, iterations and um, yeah, people uh, have used it and um, thought it was good. Um, and as I, as I just showed, we have uh, tried to produce an integrated tool, but it's still a prototype, so that's a little bit a weak point. Um, but we hope we can improve that in the future. So, if you want to do it yourself, um, you can go to our website. There I put a page where the most relevant publications are ready for you, so you can download them. Or you can have a look at this uh, mesmacentralexchange.eu website and just try out a little bit um, to see you know what happens if you click on a step, what kind of information you need. And of course you can uh, contact us, Oscar and Vanessa. And with this I think, um, yeah, that's the end of our presentation. We want to thank all our partners of course um, and we especially want to thank the EBM uh, crew.
Thanks. All right. Thank you very much to you both. So we do have some questions here, and I would just encourage those who are on the webinar to go ahead and type in your questions into the webinar interface, and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, so the first one actually refers to a slide that came up early in your presentation, Oscar, that said it seemed to indicate your map seemed to indicate a marine spatial plan off the coast of Washington or Oregon. Uh, can you talk about that, where those, where those uh, examples oh. came from <laughs> around the world? Okay. Well, I, I I told you, um, Charles Ehler gave a nice presentation on our final conference in which he treated all these um, uh, marine spatial plans. Maybe it is in this presentation which is on our website, could be. Okay. And otherwise, you, he has got a, a great website with an overview of all the marine spatial plans. So I think you should just Google him and you'll find it. Okay, thank you. All right, so another question. Uh, comments that your tools uh, are a couple of years out of date and it might make sense to collaborate with EVM tools on a single database and draw developers there to keep the information current. So I think the opportunity there is to look at the EVM tools network and, uh, and see if there's some opportunities to, to connect to those. Yeah, yeah. I think a, a number of tools were taken from EVM or, or you know, are referred, yeah, were taken from EVM. Um, the problem is, of course, that the project has ended. So. Um, <laughs> we don't have any money anymore. <laughs> okay. Actually, that was a question that I had. What happens now? You all are, mm -hmm. are completely done with the project? Yeah, there's yeah. a number. Oh, sorry, Vanessa, go ahead. Yeah. So, so basically, the project ended at the end of last year. So we had four years, and this is how far we got in four years. It was quite a, a, a process. Now, obviously, there is um, there another European fundings coming up and which are concerned with marine spatial planning. So there might be some possibilities that a part of this consortium might find themselves again and take the chance in order to develop that further. But um, as Oscar rightly mentioned, I mean one really purpose or aim would be to um, take this Mesmer Central Exchange prototype tool and to make it in something that uh, you know is can be maintained and, and has a, a life afterward, so that uh, you can continuously improve that. And this would also mean to link that back to existing initiatives such as the EBM tool website. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So there are a couple of questions since we have a lot of U.S. folks on the line asking. Uh, one is, are there any similar programs or plans to expand this program to the U.S.? You may not know the answer to that. Uh, and then the other question related to that is, is tool applicable for outside of Europe or focused mostly for European countries to use? So may I answer again? So um, there's currently no um, plan or no, you know, as far as I'm aware of, that uh, this MassMap toolbox, let's say, and this concept is applied to the U.S. Um, and there is no um, further funding uh, considered for that. And of course, it should be applicable um, because it's a concept and um, and it's a flexible concept. That means when you have a closer look at the manual, you can see that I think in most cases will find themselves in the position to go through that steps. Either if you have a data poor or rich situation, because uh, you will define the boundaries for which you will apply this framework together with the governance analysis. And in the governance analysis, you analyze your governance case. So it's, it's quite generic. It's not restricted to the EU. Yeah. So it sounds like there may be some interest here in taking a look at how it might apply in the U.S. Uh, so there is a question about um, were there indicators um, from UNESCO's World Heritage used anywhere in your analysis? Well, <laughs> it has been uh, nine case studies with, I don't know, hundreds of indicators. I would not say that I'm now aware of in one example, but I would not exclude this. It's possible. Okay. Uh, there's a question. If there are a lot of, uh, of tools, do you uh, provide criteria to guide managers into choosing the suitable one? I think we, uh, in the tool work package, we did um, a tool evaluation process, so um, to rank that and to use some criteria on, on how to evaluate those different tools. But 
when you enter the MESMA central exchange, you will be linked, as Oscar has shown, directly to the tools that are useful for a certain framework step. But we do not give a specific recommendations for managers because this might be really depend on your case you would like to assess. If you have really a vast, vast area with lots of issues, very complex, you may, may need a lot of manpower and maybe different you know, kind of tools because um, you are, have a lot of technical experience already or you would just start in that process. So I think because you would like to be, or we want it to be as generic as possible, we do not go down that route to give clear recommendations, this is a good one for that context, because it's, as I said, context dependent. Okay. Uh, I have a question that asks, can the framework be applied to green infrastructure? And I'm kind of interpreting that to mean maybe can it be applied uh, to terrestrial areas as well as mm. marine? Um, the framework follows the standards and lessons learned that you find in the literature and it, the literature mainly comes from the marine area because it's about you know, marine spatial planning. But the, the, it, it, it's based on the concept of adaptive management and an ecosystem approach to management. So with some tweaks here and there you might be able to apply it to terrestrial cases. Okay. The, the rationale at least. And, and I'm going to encourage folks, if they have more questions, to go ahead and type those in. I have one or two more questions I can ask in the meantime. I, I was curious uh, about your comment about objectives for the case studies, and I'm curious if they were um, very different, if some were more about energy and others were more about conservation, or it, did they encompass a wide range of objectives? And also, I was also curious, relating to objectives, about um, were there areas that had very um, broad goals that perhaps were not quantified in terms of objectives and, and is uh, having very specific quantifiable objectives necessary to go through this process? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so may I answer? So it's yes for all three of your questions. So we had a, a huge uh, yeah, the variation of goals. So, for example, in the Southern North Sea, we have a really strong uh, focus on the development of offshore renewables. So, we had um, objectives that are concerned to develop really offshore renewables. But in other areas, we had um, a focus, more a focus on objectives which are related to marine conservation aspects, let's say. But in a marine spatial planning context, usually you have a mix of things. So. Um, and um, you are right that the framework forces you to make broad goals or let's say more general goals to make them operational. And we have seen that in most examples this is not the case. Even in existing marine spatial plans this is not the case that goals have really been made or operational, so in terms of operational objectives. And so this is where an assessor who's using, or someone who's using the framework, he's really forced to, to bring this information together and, and, and try to make it operational. That's really exactly the key point. All right, and we do have some more questions. Someone is asking if we can please hear more about the Celtic Sea case study. <laughs> <laughs> Oscar? Well, I'm not a specialist, but the Celtic, no, the Celtic Sea, no, I, sorry, I, um, I'm not really, um, I don't really uh, know that case study very well, so. Okay, well, um, perhaps you might have another example. There's a question, of, can you give an example of an area that has adapted its management because of the results of this monitoring and evaluation? Okay. Yeah. No. Um, this is uh, this is uh, as I said before. Um, we had only one case where marine spatial management um, was implemented, which is the Norwegian case of the Barents Sea Spatial Management Plan. And the people involved in the project they used the framework to actually um, follow the process that has been, you know, used to come up with the spatial management plan of the Barents Sea and look at the review process that has been taken place. So um, they could really use the framework as a, magn let's say, as a magnifying glass to see what has happened and compare it to the, let's say, good practice that has been defined by this, um, 
by this framework. And in the other cases, so uh, for example as the Ionian Archipelago, this project helped to initiate or to push further this marine spatial planning uh, process and the recommendations that come out of this will be taken on board in real processes. As I said before, in some cases those boundaries for the assessment for the case studies have been, let's say, rather arbitrary. They're, they're not following strictly national boundaries because in Europe marine spatial planning is implemented by member states. Well, that, that leads right into another question here, which is, uh, do you have examples of a regional governance uh, system in Europe that has jointly begun implementation of MESVA in a trans transboundary area? No, there's no current example, but I can tell you that there have been other projects and initiatives that looked at um, specific cross-border marine spatial planning initiatives, but there is, this is only, let's say, on a, on a scientific or on a project basis, uh, hypothetically, there is no real-life governance process to really enforce that or to implement transnational MSP in Europe. Okay. But, but for example, in the North Sea, we have the Dogger Bank, which is a sand bank, which is a sand bank that can be protected, and it's, it's governed by the UK, by the Netherlands, by Germany, by Denmark, so it's a that many countries involved and they actually talk uh, now, the policy makers and people who were involved in this project are also involved in that process so it, it's not directly, they don't directly use the MESMA results but they, you know, the people who are there they know of the methodology and they will probably use it. Mm -hmm. Well this relates to the earlier question about adaptive management uh, you mentioned that the project is over and so I, one of the questions is now that the, the funding has ended and the project is over, um, are there plans for the, any of those case studies to continue to uh, follow through on their work and, and incorporate adaptive management? Yes, I think it's, uh, in some cases they're just uh, entered with their case study and the, the broad knowledge base they generated via the MESMA project. They entered in, in, in a new project with that and uh, actually they are like um, the, the Greek case study for example, they are really entering in a, in a project um, which uh, is concerned again with marine uh, spatial planning and, and, and really trying to come up with rec recommendations. So I think in some cases where this concept has been really, really new, it helped a lot to really um, help to, to implement or to start the real, real world process. Okay, uh, and there's a question about data. Um, I'm wondering, did you set up an ad hoc data policy for the project and were there some critical data sets that you were not able to acquire? Oscar, maybe? Um, well, that, you know, in the different steps in the framework, people needed uh, certain data sets and um, in, in some cases, like in the Black Sea, there, there was no data, there were no data sets described at all, so they and in Greece as well, I think. So they did, they did a lot of effort to describe all their data and put that in the in this uh, geo portal. Um, yeah, and in other cases, we had a lot of data, and it was a matter of combining them. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what was the question? <laughs> I think uh, I was asking if there were some cases where there were yeah. critical data sets that you just didn't have. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think for, for example, fisheries data in, in the Mediterranean was a problem, so they, yeah. I don't know in the end if they, if they got them, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's just, 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 <clears throat> just to add to that, I mean, uh, the distribution of fishing activity or uh, fisheries basically, is a, is a, most cases is a, is a, is a is a key information and it's, uh, it, in, in many cases it was simply impossible to access those data and those information. I mean in other Europe through other collaborations, I mean distribution of fishing activities uh, with the help of combining VMS and logbook data is something that maybe in other, Northern Europe we are more advanced in that process but in Southern Europe for example it's still really hard to, to, um, to use the data, to get hold of those data and um, they're really data issues for some really key data such as fisheries. Mm -hmm. So another data question, uh, 
asking about what metadata standards you used mm -hmm. and whether so, they were. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so we used um, the the ISO, the ISO the metadata standards. I don't know exactly the number, but it's the one that you should use, <laughs> the, the best. <laughs> and also the the new European um, standards, which was which is called Inspire. And of course, the aim there is to to connect all the European data in the future. But uh, when this uh, regulation was, when when the European Union uh, uh, published this regulation, we were already doing the project, I think. So it's it's really new. But we we try to use the best um, standards, which allow for uh, exchange in the future. Okay. Um. You, you answered this a little bit, Vanessa. There was a question about uh, what was your strategy to acquire and integrate this fisheries data? Hmm. Um, the strategy to integrate those data. Okay, so the case studies, if a case study is identified a fishing activity as a main human activity that needs to be considered for this evaluation, then that, and it's related to the operational objective that has been defined. Then fisheries data would be a data set that you would need you know, that you would need to map in order to, um, uh, to to go ahead. But in cases where you do not have this data, so you, if you do not have good quality data, you had a route or you have a route in the framework to still proceed with weak data by using more qualitative information, for example. But um, you would need to go explicitly into different case studies to see in which cases case studies really entered information on fishing activity. Okay. Uh, and again, another question about data, asking um, what is the strategy regarding curating the data in the long run and concerns that uh, with the project ending, the data stored will be quickly become outdated. Well, as, as I said, the data are distributed uh, not in a central, I mean, they're not in a central computer somewhere, but they're they are at the institutes. And since we all, all the institutes will in the end go, you know, use the same standards, um, it will be possible to use them for other projects as well and to, you know, to, or to deliver them in, at the Euro European Commission. So it should not be a problem, I think. It's a matter of that the people at institutes, the data uh, managers, that they maintain their data sets and then they can be distributed. Um, well, that they connect to this geo portal of us, but they will also connect to other geo portals. Um, so that, that's a strategy, I think. Okay. And then uh, there's a comment that a lot of the planning and adaptive management toolboxes and stepwise processes are similar to other adaptive management processes and asking what makes the MESMA project different from other groups that have looked at evaluation and uh, adaptive management. Okay. So I, I would say one, one point is, as, as I said, the framework, the stepwise uh, process is not, uh, we, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So basically it's, it, it's based on lessons learned and existing things. But what is behind it is really that manual. Um, if you look at this manual, you can see that a lot and lots of thinking has been going in the development of what is it I need to produce to fulfill, let's say, step one or two. So what are actually the different steps and how can be this information be used, let's say, in step four and step five? So really this interlinked and this interlinkage between the different outputs and information you need between these different steps. So and then you have that directly related, as you can see from the MESMA Central Exchange, to the data requirements. So and the different options of what do you do when you have good data, or what do you do when you have no data, for example, or bad data quality, for example, and then directly um, the link to the tools. I think this, let's say, integrated toolbox that we promise to, to deliver is something I think uh, makes it as a unique selling point. All right. Uh, we do have time for a, a few more questions, so if people want to write in any more questions. I have an example of a the governance analysis that you all did. Do you have an example of a governance process that seemed to be very successful? I, I, I can't 
I don't, I don't have an example on, on top of my hand, head. I mean, we have for the Celtic Sea, there was a very comprehensive governance assessment, and I think maybe um, this case study should be should looked a bit um, upon a bit more detail than also the Auckland and um, Pentland Firth uh, on Orkney waters. Um, has uh, an interesting, let's say, govern governance process um, described, but I, I can't, I'm not uh, the governance person itself, I just uh, would encourage them to look uh, at these two specific uh, case studies. Okay, all right, uh, and there's a question, uh, again, relating to fisheries data, asking if you can share the standards that you used uh, for fisheries data. Okay. So um, basically, the, the standards on the quality of the different uh, times fisheries data has been used are very different. I mean, in Northern Europe, we have, let's say, um, uh, already published state-of-the-art way of using or um, combining BMS data with logbook data. So in cases where fisheries data are used in that context, we follow, you know, published um, state-of-the-art methodology. Okay. All right. Uh, I will ask one more for one more call for any last final questions. But um, I think that you've really covered a lot of ground. Um, I think there's a there's a question about a link for any information on the fisheries data. Will they find that on your website? Um, they would find it on the website or within the or references within the within the case the case study itself when they used fisheries data. Okay. All right. Well, um, thank you very much, Oscar and Vanessa. We really appreciate you explaining this. There's obviously a lot of interest in this tool, and I think there's a lot that we can learn here from how you've laid it out in a very uh, systematic way and, and very comprehensive. So uh, thanks very much, and I will let everyone know that we will be posting uh, the presentation on the Marine Protected Area Center website, and uh, Open Channels will be posting the recording of the webinar on their website, so you can look for it there. Okay, thank you very much. Right. Thank you for listening. Again, thank you for listening from my side as well. <laughs> All right, and thanks to EBM okay. Tools and Open Channels.